we are here to look at banking and financial institutions and the analytics that is done for banking and financial institutions. Let's take a look at what is meant by banking and financial institutions. How do these institutions aid us and the economy and finally how do they make money? So what are the key drivers of profitability in this segment of industry? So the start of banking and financial institutions, we are going to take a look at the following. The entities that make this institution, which starts with money, which is the raw material as well as the finished product for this set of institutions. Banks, which are the conduits of money. Credit cards, which we use in lieu of money. Loans, which help us get what we want before we can save up for it. Insurance products, which give us some sort of stability and some assurance of security. And a couple of types of organizations, which aid all this happening. These are credit bureaus and securitization agencies. After this, we'll take a look at data structures and data availability in banking and financial institutions and the analytical techniques and their applications. Especially, the focus will be marketing analytics, where we'll take a look at campaign management as well as uh, other profitability-related decision-making that banks and financial institutions do. Then we'll take a look at credit uh, risk, which is basically figuring out the best profile of customers to lend and the best products for those customers. And the third part would be fraud risk. So fraud, you know, is uh, accountable for the largest amount of loss making in any type of institution. Banking and financial services, lending products especially are very prone to fraud losses. All this will be achieved through case studies and uh, real life examples so that we get a hands-on experience of how this works. I've put together my favorite quotes with respect to money. It doesn't matter if you're black or white, the only color that really matters is green. If you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. So often we know that you get best products only by paying the best amount of money. The mint makes it first, it is up to you to make it last. So we are responsible for the equation of our income and expenditures. Now what is money? It all started with the barter system. You had something which I wanted, I had something that you wanted and therefore we exchanged. So grain for fish, fish for grain, so both of us now have grain and fish. But this was a very tedious methodology and what we found is that it may not answer your purpose all the time, right? So you might have something somebody else wants, but you do not want what that person has. Then what will happen? So here what happens is people move to some common standards of what was valuable and these were used as units of exchange. So cows were valuable, cattle is valuable, and seashells were valuable, and then precious metals were valuable. All of this culminated in notes becoming valuable, which stood in lieu of this. So it's difficult to roam around with all these other three things, cattle, seashells, coinage. So notes became much easier to carry and as long as it was backed with precious commodity, they served the purpose of exchange. Before notes, we had coins, etc. And have you ever seen something like the money plant being valuable enough to be used for exchange? Most likely not. Why? Because this is a very common plant. There's no intrinsic value to this. It grows very easily. Everyone can grow it. So there was no value to it. Hence, to conclude, what is money? It is a unit of account. It is a storage of value. It's a medium of exchange. It is basically the lubricant which makes the economy go round. And a lot of our lives depend on being able to holistically use money to lead fruitful lives. So if we were to take a look at what is money and the early history of money, we find that the intrinsic value was of precious metals, which weren't very commonly available, was realized very early on. It then moved to the banking system, which was basically storage of things with intrinsic value in granaries and in temples. Coins came in and then came printed banknotes, which were much more standardized forms of money. The printed notes started out in China in 800 AD, but due to a prolonged inflation, it slowly lost its value and they went back to using commodities for units of exchange. In the 17th century, 
the Europeans discovered how to use standardized notes and this is how notes and coins started out and they still exist in our modern economies. However, in our modern economies, we've gone beyond this, right? We've gone to checks, etc., which can stand in lieu of coins and notes. So, how does the money move in the economy? Now that we know that money is something which has intrinsic value, how does this intrinsic value move in the economy? There's something called a circular referencing of money, circular flow of money. This circular flow of money means that let's start from one part of this circle, right? The households, you and I. We go to the product markets to get consumption related goods. So these firms and companies actually make goods in bulk and they sell it to multiple product markets. These firms and companies go to the factor market to purchase labor, land, raw materials, etc. And who is part of the factor market? We, householders are part of the factor market. So this is where we get our payment from. Thus, the same money circulates within so many entities. Now, this is on a larger scale. If we were to take the smaller scales of financial institutions and governments, householders go and store their savings in banks and financial institutions. Banks and financial institutions pay interest to these householders for the money that they utilize further. Now, this money which is stored with them is lent out to firms and companies for loans to start business. These firms and companies pay interest to financial institutions. Now, these firms and companies pay taxes to the government and the government buys goods and services from these firms and companies. The government incidentally makes payments to us householders who are government employees and every one of us pays taxes to the government. So you see, there are small, small cycles also within this larger cycle. So now that we know that there's a circular flow of money which keeps the economy thriving, let's take a look at how the banking system supports this flow. So money is printed, you know, you cannot randomly print money. If you and I print a 100 rupee note and go and tell anyone that this is a 100 rupee note, please accept it. Do you think they will accept it? No. And why won't they accept it? There is no value to that money. It's just paper until backed by an intrinsic value which comes simply because the government has kept in the treasury gold and silver to back up the notes that it makes. So the treasury is the place where physical precious metals are kept so that the government can create bank notes which can circulate in the economy. And you and I know this, right? If we take the government note and go to a bank and pay some X amount of money, we will get Y amount of gold in exchange. Now this banking system, there's something called fractional reserve. We will take into account once we start working and studying on banks. But basically what happens is the treasury releases the notes to one central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank or the Reserve Bank of India in India or the central bank of the country depending on the country. Now this Federal Reserve Bank or the central bank's balance sheet looks like this. The assets are so many kilos of gold and silver which is worth X amount of money and the liabilities is X amount of money in note formation or in note form and coin form. So this is the money that exists in an economy. Now what happens is that the Federal Reserve Bank, you and I cannot have an account with the Fed. We cannot have an RBI account. So RBI has a second structure, a secondary structure called commercial banks which help you and me and householders and companies to go and open accounts and partake of this flow of currency. We now know that the entire amount of money in the world is backed up by the reserves in gold and silver and precious metals which various governments will maintain. So the key takeaway is the origin of money. It's very, very old. The flow of money in the economy, how each one of us is responsible for the flow of money and the flow of money through the banking system. How is these intrinsic valuable metals circulated in the system 
through form of nodes so the nodes in themselves do not have any power the only power is it's backed by reserves of gold and silver and precious metals we'll take a look at the next step the way banks function in the next people